Number five, Scientology. I figured it was the easiest to kick off today, you know, with the most obvious cult, and personally for me, the scariest. Scientology is a set of beliefs and practices invented by the American author L. Ron Hubbard, who developed a series of ideas that he called Dianetics, which he represented as a form of therapy. Okay, yeah, that's great therapy. An organization that he established in 1950 to promote it went bankrupt, and he lost the rights to his book in 1952. He then recharacterized his ideas as a religion for tax purposes and renamed them Scientology. By 1954, he had regained the rights to Dianetics and founded the Church of Scientology, which remains the largest organization promoting Scientology today. There are practitioners independent of the church in what is called the Free Zone, and estimates put the number of Scientologists at just under 40,000 people worldwide. So, you know, not a lot of people at all, just a small town. Scientology beliefs include reincarnation and that traumatic events cause problematic engrams in the mind. They claim that an activity called auditing can remove the bad engrams. A fee is charged though for each session of auditing. Once an auditor deems an individual free of engrams, typically after several years, they are given the status of clear. After being deemed clear, adherents can take part in further activities called operating thetan levels, which require further payments. The operating thetan texts are kept secret for most followers and are revealed only after adherents have typically given hundreds of thousands of dollars to the Scientology organization. If you don't have ridiculous amounts of money to burn, don't worry, they're freely available online on sites such as WikiLeaks. And if you don't want to waste your time, these texts say past lives took place in extraterrestrial cultures. Look, I don't agree with Scientology, but I do agree with aliens visiting Earth. But these involve an alien called Xenu, described as a planetary ruler that existed 70 million years ago who brought billions of aliens to Earth and killed them with thermonuclear weapons. Yeah. I totally believe that. Despite being kept secret from most followers, this forms the essential mythological framework of Scientology's crazy Logic? Question mark? From soon after the formation, these groups have generated considerable opposition and controversy, in several instances because of their illegal activities. In 1967, Hubbard established a new elite group, the Sea Organization or Sea Org, the membership of which was drawn from the most committed members of the church. By 1981, the 21-year-old David Miscavige, who had been one of you know his closest aides in the Sea Org, rose to prominence. Hubbard died at his ranch in Creston, California on January 24th of 1986, and Miscavige succeeded Hubbard as the head of the church, a position he holds till this day. If you really want a mystery to solve, try and find David's wife. In 2013, actress Leah Remini, a former Scientologist and vocal critic of the organization, filed a missing persons report with the Los Angeles Police Department concerned about her disappearance. The LAPD allegedly contacted Shelley and closed the case within hours. Despite assurances from Church of Scientology spokespeople that Shelley Miscavige is alive and well, many continue to express skepticism. In 2022, after hearing about an investigation into now-retired LAPD, PD Captain Cory Palka about alerting others of confidential police investigations, Remini revealed photographs of Palka accepting a $20,000 check from Scientology for LAPD charities and one of a Scientology information kiosk located in the LAPD Hollywood division. While speaking with Palka in his office, Remini noticed a letter of thanks to him from Scientology with an invitation to lunch at their celebrity center. So. Bribery. As of 2023, Shelley Miscavige's whereabouts remain unknown, and who knows if we'll ever know. In the 1970s, Hubbard's followers engaged in a program of criminal infiltration of the U.S. government, resulting in several executives of the organization being convicted and imprisoned for multiple offenses by a U.S. federal court. Now, Hubbard himself was convicted in absentia of fraud by a French court in 1978 and sentenced to four years in prison. And in 1992, a court here in Canada convicted the Scientology organization in Toronto of spying on law enforcement and government agencies and criminal breach of trust later upheld by the Ontario Court of Appeal. The Church of Scientology was convicted of fraud by a French court in 2009, a judgment upheld by the Supreme Court of Cassation in 2013. The Church of Scientology has been described by government inquiries, international parliamentary bodies, scholars, law lords, and numerous superior court judgments as both a dangerous cult and a manipulative profit-making business. I could talk about them for hours and just how awful they are, so let me know in the comments if that's, you know, something I would be interested in. Number 4. Family International Initially called Teens for Christ, Children of God, or COG, it was founded in 1968 by rogue preacher David Berg in Huntington Beach, California. Attracting young runaways and hippies, David preached a kind of worship that combined the ways of Jesus Christ with the free love movement of the 1960s. Group living, zealous converting, and isolated communes were all pillars of this church. Members, who amounted to around 15,000 people across the world at its peak, didn't go to work or go to school. And they also didn't believe in the nuclear family, so younglings were grouped together and lived separately from their parents. 
In the late 1970s, COG became notorious for the sexual practices that one of the founder's own daughters later described as religious sexual coercion. David coined the term flirty fishing, which was a sexual practice in which women would allegedly have sex with men to bring them into the cult. And if that wasn't scummy enough, he also promoted and encouraged the sexualization of younglings within the COG community. As David manipulated the COG family with his sadistic practices, members started leaving the community, including the families of actors Joaquin Phoenix and Rose McGowan, who both grew up in the communes. Former COG members began coming forward in the early 1990s, describing an environment that permitted and encouraged the physical and sexual taking advantage of younglings. Ricky Dupree appeared on a talk show in 1993 and revealed that he'd been ordered by the group to forcibly fornicate with someone barely in the double digits of age. Ricky later took his own life, sadly like many other members of the group, including the founder's son Ricky Rodriguez, who was sexually taken advantage of throughout his life by his father and the group. Although David died in 1994 while under FBI investigation, the cult continues to exist and now goes by the name Family International, although the group claims that the horrific practices are a thing of the past. Why do I not believe them? No. Number three, realism. Realism is the teaching that humanity was birthed by a hyper advanced race of aliens called the Elohim, who genetically engineered us as their children. Our most famous religious leaders over the years were Elohim human hybrids, whose wondrous abilities and powers were mislabeled as prophets. It's said that by 2035, if realism's followers have achieved the tenets correctly and fulfilled the movement's teaching by spreading its message and building an embassy to welcome its 39 prophets, the group rose to prominence in the 1970s when its leader, Claude Vorian, who called himself Rayo, claims he had an experience with a UFO where a spacecraft flying overhead was full of beings who told him about humanity's future and past and handed him a bible and told him it was his mission to build that embassy. Now all of this sounds like pretty standard cult stuff, worshipping aliens who are secret progenitors, but where things get pretty interesting and worthy of note is that around 2002, a company called CloneAid, with direct ties to realism, claimed to have done the impossible and cloned a baby girl, appropriately named Eve. Immediately it spurned all kind of controversy, led to several investigations, discussions about the ethics and morality of the situation, but despite all this, no actual evidence of the clone baby ever came up. Eve isn't the only alleged baby birthed this way through Clonade, with several claims of Clonade brand clones being produced since the original story in 2002, all with dubious claims, including controversial rapper Kid Boo who claims to have been born there. So either Eve is still hiding somewhere, or maybe it was a bit of an exaggeration. Regardless, CloneAid charges up to $200,000 for their services, which might seem a bit expensive, but hey, you're getting a great deal on a clone, you're gonna make your money back on that. So if anyone's got a piggy bank just weighing them down, please send me a message and then get back to me and introduce me to you and your clone. Number two, the Church of Bible Understanding. Hey, real quick for me, what's your favorite Seinfeld episode? Yeah, I probably could have guessed it was the comeback or the contest, and those are both great answers. But what about the checks? Where George gets involved with that group of carpet cleaners who end up trying to recruit for a cult, and, and he's all mad they want his boss, but they don't want him? That's the kind of shenanigan that could only happen to Costanza. Turns out that episode was based on a real group called the Church of Bible Understanding, although at the time they were going by Christian Brothers Carpet Cleaners, no doubt where the idea came from. This undertaking was one of the group's many noble business ventures, including a used van business and a New York chain of used antique stores. Like most cults, the group was led by a charismatic figurehead, one Stuart Trail, who maintained to his followers that only he was capable of understanding the word of God and understanding how to annoy George Costanza. Their leader was expelled from the Pentecostal church he worshipped at in the early 70s, and after his expulsion, refused to give up the dream and formed his own church, promising a communal lifestyle of salvation. And if reports from former members are to be believed, hard work for below minimum wage. Members were isolated from their friends, families, and communities, and encouraged to devote themselves wholly to the church. Besides a less than flattering appearance on Seinfeld, the group most recently made headlines after an orphanage they built in Haiti had burned to the ground. After several claims that orphanages the group had been producing in Haiti had been extremely substandard, shoddy, overcrowded, and dirty. The leader, Stuart Trail, passed away in 2018. Current estimates suggest that the group has dwindled down from thousands of members in its heyday to just dozens now. And there's no word if Larry David was ever a member or associated. Number one, the Nuibian Nation. Dwight York had a dream. Like many Americans, he believed in simple things, 
like amassing an army to help him fight Satan amongst the stars. Let me back that up for you just a little bit and introduce you to the Nuwabian Nation, or the United Nuwabian Nation of Moors. Adding just a twist of Christianity, African rituals, and a heavy dose of Egyptian mythology mixed with aliens, Dwight York had a perfect recipe for a wild cult story. The nation believed that they needed to prepare themselves for an inevitable duel of the fates among the stars, and that the 144,000 chosen ones would accompany Dwight into outer space for the fate of the galaxy, zooming away on a flying city to Orion to fight Satan. Now I have no comment about any of that. Maybe it was the cult of personality, maybe it was the promise that you could potentially get involved in a Star War, but this was a surprisingly popular movement around rural Georgia, where York built up a massive compound that looked a bit like a pavilion out of your favorite Egypt themed amusement park, and bringing in members in droves. As the numbers grew, the mythology grew, incorporating cloning, racial theory, anti-government conspiracy, and a whole lot more. But the dreams of the Starfarers would be cut short when an investigation in 2002 revealed a horrifying truth. That their leader Dwight York was involved in a massive human trafficking operation said to have been comprised of as many of a thousand people. On May 8, 2002, the Sheriff's Department of Georgia with the aid of the FBI shut the entire operation down. York was arrested and sentenced to a life sentence where he's still serving out his 135 years. One Georgia sheriff involved, Sheriff Sills, described the trafficking operation as the best kept secret in Georgia I'd seen in my 47 years as a police officer. The compound was seized and swiftly destroyed. Despite all this though, there are still members out there waiting. Kicking off at number 5, we have the Church of Bible Understanding. Founded in 1971 by Stuart Trail, this communal organization was originally known as the Forever Family at its home location of Allentown in Pennsylvania. It gathered steam in the late 70s after moving its headquarters to New York, where it developed a controversial network of churches and communes and amassed over 100,000 members at its peak. Bizarrely enough, Trail's motive was to encourage members to break off contact with their family forcing them into their communal lifestyle and working essentially as free labour for a number of businesses. These included a carpet cleaning business and a used van venture. The group has been accused of being a cult on numerous occasions and it's suspected that their leader Stuart Trail became a multi-millionaire from the exploitation of young vulnerable adults. In later years after a string of controversies its members dwindled to a few hundred but recently in 2013 the church was accused of gross misconduct at a number of their orphanages in Haiti despite claiming to spend 2.5 million dollars on their upkeep annually. Next up at number 4 Realism. One of the most notorious cults in modern history, Realism began in 1974 after a Frenchman named Claude Vauhelon claimed he'd had a vision of an alien spacecraft descending over southern France. He said that the craft was filled with strange beings that told him humans were the only hope for the future of the universe and then handed him a bible. Apparently he was there for over 6 days and the head alien, coincidentally named Yahweh, explained that the old testament is actually a record of humanity's earth early days and that he needed to construct an embassy ready for the aliens when they would eventually return to inhabit earth. Sounds pretty kooky right? Well for the next 3 decades his teachings amassed a following of over 20,000 people where they essentially worshipped aliens, opposed violence, championed science and participated in mass orgies. Whatever floats your boat I guess. Well things got even weirder in 2002 when the cult claimed to have done the impossible and cloned a human, a baby girl named Eve. Of course everyone went nuts, even the White House got involved, lawsuits were filed but the realists stuck to their guns and still to this very day claim to be still producing human clones. Number 3 on this list is the Fundamentalist Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints. You guys might be familiar with this one right now as it's currently very popular. Netflix just released a documentary about this cult so if you want a more in depth summary of what went down definitely go check that out. Ranker says that this cult was an offshoot of Mormonism that's constantly in the news for unsavory reasons. FLDS openly embraces polygamy, which the mainstream LDS outlawed a century ago. The group has anywhere from 6,000 to 10,000 members in rural Utah and Arizona, with the group having almost total control of two small, linked border towns in two states. While Mormon splinter groups had been around long before, the FLDS was incorporated in 1991 by a group of men who had been excommunicated by the church 
church. They went through a range of leaders who all declared themselves prophets until being taken over by Rulon Jeffs in 2002. He passed shortly thereafter and his son Warren took over. It was under Warren Jeffs that the FLDS practices of child marriage, bigamy, racism, abandonment of teenage boys all became public knowledge. Jeffs was sent to prison in 2007 but continues to be the de facto head of the church while his successors squabble for power. This cult certainly isn't as powerful as it once was and you have to imagine that as time goes on and more people are educated on what this cult did in the past, that will continue on a downward trajectory. But for now, they still aren't totally finished and if you wanted to, then you could join this group. Absolutely do not do that though because these people get up to some very weird and often illegal things. Like the leader was literally sent to jail and is still there rotting away. I would not want to get myself into a situation where I'm anywhere close to the people that support that guy. Number two on this list is the New Wabian Nation. This one is absolutely nuts, guys, so strap in. Ranker says, formerly known as the United New Wabian Nation of Moors, this is a cult of personality based around founder Dwight York. Combining Christianity, ancient Egyptian iconography, African rituals, and a belief that aliens are coming, the nation believes that 144,000 chosen people will be taken away in a flying city, spirited to Orion, to prepare for the final fight against Satan. Shockingly, York's mishmash of New Age concepts, black power militancy, and ancient Egyptian religion caught on in both the hip-hop community and in rural Georgia, where York built a massive compound made with donated funds. York's mythology grew incorporating cloning, racial theory, cosmology, anti-government conspiracies, and linguistics. Even as the cult grew, York was under investigation, and he was finally detained in 2000 2002 for running a massive human trafficking ring comprising as many as 1,000 individuals. He was sent to prison for life and his compound was seized and demolished. The group still exists, though in much smaller numbers. If we just ignore all of the human rights violations for a second, which we shouldn't by the way, but let's just do it anyways for one moment, then at the best possible case scenario, you join this cult and then dedicate your life preparing for a battle with Satan that you may not ever have because not only is that crazy, but you might not even be in the 140,000 people who gets picked to have said battle with Satan. Like, this just doesn't make any sense at all, guys. Then we add back on all of those human rights violations and all the other stuff that York was sent to jail for, and you get one sick and twisted cocktail that is this cult. Number one on this list is Church Universal and Triumphant. Yet another cult of personality in New Age clothes, the CUT was founded in 1975 as an offshoot of a different movement, Summit Lighthouse. Founder Elizabeth Clare Prophet pitched herself and her husband as messengers of the Ascended Masters, a set of spiritually awakened ancient beings central to the Theosophy belief system. They also threw in elements of Christian science, the, the I Am movement, and Mormon-style doomsday prepping. The Prophets grew wealthy enough to buy large spreads in the Santa Monica Mountains and Montana, while members drove themselves into debt building fallout shelters and paying huge sums of money to reserve a spot in the post-nuclear conflict society. The church was also accused of making illicit straw purchases and of using sleep deprivation against members who attempted to leave. In ill health, the prophet retired in 1999 and passed 10 years later. Since then, the church has gone through legal problems and succession squabbles, but members still meet on a regular basis. So yeah, just join this cult if you want to potentially get tortured from sleep deprivation. Oh, and while we're torturing you, we're also going to take all your money and invest it into some underground bunker that you'll probably never use. If that doesn't sound like an excellent use of time and money to you, which it probably shouldn't, then I really wouldn't recommend joining this cult. Number five in this list is Happy Science. Kind of a fun name that they have there for sure, but maybe not the funnest of cults. Ranker says, if you're looking for a mashup of world religions, New Age, Hokum, 
far-right nationalism and infrastructure spending, then Japanese cults Happy Science is for you. It was founded in 1986 by Ryoho Okawa, a former salaryman who was enraptured by a group called the God Light Association. He soon formed his own cult of personality called Science of Happiness and changed its name to Happy Science a few years later. Okawa believes he is the human incarnation of a supreme being called El Kenter who combines Christ, Buddha, Muhammad, and every other prophetic deity to create a nine-dimensional heaven with him at the head. He's also created a massively complex mythology of New Age nonsense while simultaneously founding a political wing called the Happiness Realization Party. Here's where the strangeness goes into overdrive though. As his party advocates a vicious Japanese nationalism devoted to denying historical cruelties, advocating conflict with China and North Korea, and rebuilding Japan's infrastructure. The group claims to have 12 million members around the world, has a multimedia arm, and enjoys tax-exempt status in the US. So basically, if it was up to this group, Japan would be invading China and North Korea and probably well on its way to starting World War III. So yeah, definitely not one that you want to be a part of because that could obviously get very bad very quickly. Not to mention you need to worship this dude who believes that he's the human incarnation of all these cool people. I mean, if he actually is the human reincarnation of all of those people, then that's freaking awesome, but... Come on guys, I think the likelihood that this dude is Jesus as well as Buddha is pretty low. Number four on this list is the Brethren. Yeah, so joining this cult really would just be the worst, guys. You just need to give up so much to do it. Ranker says, also known as Body of Christ and Garbage Eaters, the Brethren are an apocalyptic offshoot of the 70s Jesus movement, eschewing worldly possessions and earthly pleasures to purify themselves for the coming end of the world. Brethren members essentially live as vagrants doing odd jobs to survive, eating trash, avoiding bathing and medical treatment, and giving whatever money they do make to the group. They also forbid dancing and laughing until the return of Jesus, bar members from communicating with family, and forbid contact between binary genders. Group founder Jim Roberts passed in December 2015, leaving the future of the secretive cult unclear. You literally need to give up everything in your entire life to get ready for when Jesus returns. I just don't get this one, guys. Like, maybe it's because I'm not part of this cult, but I guess it isn't clear to me why Jesus would be angry that you have earthly possessions. Like, what does he have against you having the occasional knickknack, you know? Also, there's the whole thing where you literally need to eat garbage. I don't think that they're joking about that, guys. Like, you will be eating scraps if you join this cult. Never having a warm meal again, that's about as terrifying as it can get. And next up, number three, the cult of Isis. Popping over to ancient Egypt, the phrase death cult doesn't get more death E than the cult of Isis. Incredibly popular with ancient Grecian and Roman society, the goddess Isis was central in the Old Kingdom's Osiris myth, where her husband, the divine king Osiris, was slain and resurrected by her hand. The mysteries of Isis were strangely popular in the ancient world, where initiates to the cult would undergo elaborate ritual purification before being brought into the innermost part of Isis' temple. The catch, though, was that they had to pledge their mortal soul to the goddess of rebirth. Sounds innocent enough, eh? But this often meant that somewhere, someone along the line was getting ritualistically sacrificed. Never good. Swinging in at number two, Asherism. We've covered these guys quite regularly in our Demon series, but if you didn't know, Asherism is pretty gnarly business. Known as the national cult of the Assyrian people, where the majority of ancient Assyria chose to worship a polytheistic religion with thousands of different gods, similar to that of ancient Babylonia. They shared many creation myths to that of Judaism and Christianity, such as the Great Flood and the Tower of Babel. But what separates Asherism is its fascination with demonism and their willingness to worship. For example, the tale of Lilith, Adam's first wife who went on to become the demonic queen of the succubi. Although you could argue that this is just, in essence, a collection of smaller cults, Asherism didn't come into written fruition until after the fall of the Assyrian Empire, where these cults were continued to be worshipped in the surviving city of Assur. This became a melting pot for Asherism, with the cults of 
Sin, Nikal, Bel, Nabu and Tammuz being twisted into a fervent blend of godhood and demonism. Mass ritualistic sacrifice, stake burnings, cannibalism, it all went down here and it's not good. And finally at number one, the Knights Templar. This wouldn't be an ancient cult list without everybody's favourite shadowy secret society, the Knights Templar. Also known as the poor fellow soldiers of Christ and of the Temple of Solomon, that's a mouthful, the Knights Templar were a Catholic military order recognised in 1139 by the Papal Bull of the Holy See. Although records state that the Templar were active until about 1312, the order's main functionality was prominence in Christian finance. They managed a large economic infrastructure throughout the Christian world, developing financial techniques that would later become an early form of banking. In essence, they were the world's first multinational corporation, which you know has led many people to believe that they're still around to this very day, just in another form. Cue conspiracy music. Their initiation rites are still shrouded in secrecy, where outsiders were discouraged from attending the ceremony over fear of its sensitive nature. This led to the suspicion of medieval inquisitors and eventually the acquisition and execution of over 90% of the order's members who were burned at the stake. Well, what did they discover? Well, no one really knows, but it constituted a pretty harsh response from the church. Coming in at number 5, Gather the Daughters by Jenny Melamed. Jenny Melamed's debut novel Gather the Daughters transports readers to a post-apocalyptic colony ruled by tyrannical men. The futuristic community is shaped by sexism, censorship and government mandated procreation. The book has been compared to The Handmaid's Tale due to its depiction of female servitude. Now as the novel's heroines come of age they are confronted with depravity of the colony's traditions and thanks to specific occurrences, a rebellion is sparked. Now unlike The Handmaid's Tale, we're given very little information about life beyond the island the cult is residing on, with Melamed keeping us in the dark and just as frustrated as her characters. It's a captivating novel that inspires but at times sickens, but is mostly a meditation on the dangers of misogyny and fear. In at number 4, Underground, The Tokyo Gas Attack and the Japanese Psyche by Haruki Murakami. Published between 1997 and 1998, Underground is a book by Japanese novelist Haruki Murakami about the 1995 Aum Shinriko Sarin gas attack on the Tokyo subway. The attack was an act of domestic terrorism perpetrated on 20th of March 1995 by members of the cult movement Aum Shinriko. In five coordinated attacks, the cult members released Sarin on three lines of the Tokyo Metro during during rush hour, killing 13 people, severely injuring 50 and causing temporary vision problems for nearly 1,000 others. The cult, which was led by Shoko Asahara, had already carried out several other assassinations and terror attacks using sarin, and had also produced several other nerve agents including VX and attempted to produce petroleum toxin. In the raid that followed the attack, police arrested many senior members of the cult, with over 200 members being arrested. To this day, the attack remains the deadliest terror attack in Japan. Now Murakami's novel is made up of a series of interviews with individuals who were affected by the attacks. And the English translation also includes interviews with members of Aum, the religious cult responsible for the attacks. In the novel he attempts to make sense of the horrific attacks and in turn it's a true testament to the resilience of the human spirit. Number 3. The Independent Order of Odd Fellows. Oh, the Independent Order of Odd Fellows. Well, <laughs> finally, a secret society that's right for me. How do I gain entrance to this. Well, while I figure that out, I'll mull over the history with you. It's unknown when the Independent Order of Odd Fellows was founded for sure, but the first reference of it ever written comes in 1812 and references George IV. Before he was named Prince Regent of the United Kingdom, George IV had been a member of the Freemasons for a while. He wanted a member of his family to come join the Freemasons with him and was hoping that his royal connections and purse strings would be able to bypass the lengthy, complicated initiation process. Unfortunately, no one is given such freedom to bypass Masonic initiation rights. Come on, you should've known that. So George, bittered by an order that wouldn't have him, splintered off to form a rival club, the Independent Order of Odd Fellows. Love the name. Although the website for the order claims that it was started all the way back in 1066, although there aren't as many sources to cite this. Much like the Knights, their guiding principles are the principles of friendship, love, and truth. And its members strive to live by these principles in their daily lives. The organization is non-political and non-sectarian 
Marion, welcoming individuals from all walks of life and creeds. Are you also getting a bit disappointed that a lot of secret societies on this list have mainly said that they just do like charity work and like helping out around town and, and getting people the help they deserve? No, come on. Where's the secret soldiers? Where's the, <laughs> the lizard people living under the White House? Where I, none of this is showing up yet. The Order of Odd Fellas places an emphasis on community service. Its members engage in various charitable activities. They provide relief to the needy. They assist the sick and disabled. They offer scholarships and educational opportunities. Do you guys not conceal any Martians or any UFOs or anything? You just go around giving homes to the elderly and orphans? Gosh, are, are there any secret societies that are trying to control the world still? <sighs> Now regardless of how the order got its start, the order is strong and still going today. The club has counted several British Prime Ministers among its rank, Winston Churchill and Stanley Baldwin to name a few. Number 2. The Patriotic Order Sons of America Imagine a time when patriotism was at its peak and everyone wanted to celebrate their love for their country in a unique way. How fitting that I'm filming this on the 4th of July. Happy Joey Chestnut Day Americans. Enter the Patriotic Order Sons of America, the POSA. This organization founded in 1840 aimed to promote American values, apple pie, American history, and strengthen the bonds of brotherhood among its members. So it's kind of like the America fan club, you know? Americans love America, by and large, but these guys really loved America. Picnics, parades, all manner of social congregation, so long as that social congregation was about celebrating Uncle Sam's land of the free and home of the brave. Now, I am making it sound like it's a patriotic summer camp. And it kind of is. But it was also about education and the preservation of American culture. They upheld the importance of American history by building historical societies, museums, and libraries to collect and document artifacts and stories from the past. Like a time machine to the days of old. Now like any other secret society, obviously they have to have some rituals and ceremonies. As far as we know, nothing too outright sinister, mostly just initiation rites. If you ask the organization, they'll tell you they're one of the most progressive, patriotic institutions in the United States. Now how progressive they actually are, definitely up for a little bit of debate. In the 1890s they were only open for white Americans. Today the order opens its membership to all native born or naturalized American male citizens who believe in their country. So it's not super progressive, but as far as secret societies go, it seems like they're pretty benevolent and do just want to celebrate the country and not rule it in secret. Or maybe they do, I don't know. And number one, the Molly Maguires. In the 1870s, 24 foremen and supervisors in the coal mines of Pennsylvania were assassinated. Now who was behind the plot? The leading suspect was the secret society, the Molly Maguires. Now that's a secret society name. The Molly Maguires were an organization of Irish militants who it's thought got their names because they frequently used women's clothing as a disguise while carrying out acts. This sounds a lot more like it's just a gang than it does a secret society. I'm pretty sure these guys were the bad guys at Red Dead Redemption too. Operating primarily in the mid 1860s to 1870s, the group was named after a legendary folktale of Molly Maguire, an Irish nun who was evicted from her home. As such, the Maguires acted as a sort of big brother for Irish immigrants in America, aiming to address harsh working conditions and mistreatment by whatever means necessary. Faced with low wages, long hours, and unsafe working conditions, the Maguires sought to protect the rights and interests of their family through resistance resistance, sabotage, and violence. The organization operated covertly, with members swearing oaths of loyalty and secrecy. Their tactics included coercion, intimidation, and you better believe just a little bit of political assassination. They targeted mine operators, foremen, and individuals they perceived as oppressors within the mining industry. Bots, murders, all of this stuff pretty commonplace. The rise of the Molly Maguires attracted attention from mining companies and the government. The notorious Pinkerton Detective Agency, the actual bad guys from Red Dead Redemption 2, was hired to infiltrate and gather evidence against the group. High profile trials followed, resulting in the conviction and execution of several Molly Maguires. The trials were marked by controversy and allegations of false testimony, leading to debates about the fairness of the proceedings. But if you know anything about the Pinkertons, it's that they don't really play fair. Today, the Molly Maguires are still sort of a subject of historical interest, serving as a reminder of the complex dynamics between labor, management, and immigrant communities in the United States during the 19th century. I don't really have a joke to end that on. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't think that far ahead. Number five, the Brethren. Do you feel like the modern world has got you down, got you running around, feeling overwhelmed? Perhaps you need a break from it all and you want to get away. 
I want to go back to a simpler time. Well then perhaps the Brethren is the movement you've been looking for. Founded by Jim T. Roberts, the movement seeks to shed all of the convenience and accommodations of modern living, with its members instead choosing to live as vagrants, drifting on the edge of society, away from the prying eye of the modern world. Their leader believes that in order to be guaranteed a spot in heaven, one must purify themselves. And to the brethren, this means purifying themselves of just about every facet of modern living. As part of their renouncement of all modern living, brethren must forsake all of their family, friends, their jobs, their livelihoods, all in favor of their new brothers. You aren't allowed to partake in any material goods of any kind. Sew your own clothing and eat what you can scavenge. This particularly grisly habit is what gave the cult its enduring nickname of garbage eaters for their tendency to dumpster dive. You're not even allowed to laugh, celebrate, or play, as all celebrations must be saved for the return of the Savior at the end of the world. Although, giving those conditions, I'm not sure what you'd have to laugh about. It goes as far, too, as members being barred from receiving treatment or medicine, even for common curable illnesses. Because members are forced to cut themselves off from their families, oftentimes members disappear without their family members ever even getting to know what happened. As such, groups have sprung up to try and reconnect brethren to their families and hopefully get them a dinner that didn't come out of a dumpster. Why not toss a subscribe our way and join our group here? Our teachings are scary videos every day, and the only thing you have to give us is a subscribe, and if you're feeling really generous, maybe a like too. Let's keep going. Number four, Happy Science. Happy Science, formerly known as the Institute for Research in Human Happiness, is a Japanese New Age religion that's sort of a loot bag for as many religious concepts as you can think of. In happy science, all gods that have been worshipped throughout history across various religions were actually all the same god, named El Kantare, roughly translating to the singer. The group's founder, Ryoho Okawa, just happens to be the incarnation of all these holy deities manifested as one man. He also claims to have the energies of various celebrities inside him, including Freddie Mercury and former US presidents. The group preaches happiness, obviously. Following the group's mantra, in order to obtain happiness, one must practice the principles of happiness known as the fourfold path. Love that gives, wisdom, self-reflection, and progress. Now, Happy Science isn't just some fringe group in a tent in the backwoods. Rough estimates suggest that the group pulls inwards of $45 million a year. Sounds like there's some kind of profit happening here. That's a, that, that's a little pun for you. Happy Science has a full-on media division, producing several animated and live action films, and publishing books numbering close to the thousands, mostly being transcriptions of Okawa's lectures about happiness, spirituality, and occasionally aliens, as a major part of the group's belief revolve around UFOs, aliens, and other cosmic entities. The group is fairly widespread, boasting temples across the world and various continents. The group's statistics claim that there are 11 million members worldwide, although more conservative estimates put it around 30,000 worldwide. Regardless, happy science is something that's clearly making a lot of people happy. Coming in at 3, The Shelter Cycle by Peter Rock. Inspired by true events, The Shelter Cycle, written by Peter Rock, tells the story of two children, Francine and Colville, who grew up in the Church Universal and Triumphant, a religion that predicted the world would come to an end in the late 1980s. While their parents built underground shelters to withstand the impending Soviet missile strike, Francine and Colville played in the Montana wilderness, where invisible spirits watched over them. However, when the apocalypse does not occur, the sex members are forced to resurface and grow up in a world they believed might no longer exist. Now, the depiction of the cult is harrowing, but what makes the book more unsettling is the depiction of someone who has survived it. Someone who, having lost his rudder, might be capable of absolutely anything. Now, as outsiders, we believe that when people escape a cult, they are safe. Right? However, Peter Rock turns this on its head and examines how cults continue to live inside of us, evolving and changing over time. Coming in at 2, The Girls by Emma Klein. The Girls is a 2016 debut novel by Emma Klein and is loosely inspired by the Manson family and the murder of actress Sharon Tate. The novel itself is set in 1969 and focuses on 14 year old Evie Boyd, who feels 
isolated and unloved and ends up spending the majority of that summer with a group of teenage girls on a ranch who are all devoted to a man named Russell. Now the novel never explicitly states that it's talking about the Manson murders but it's obvious to almost everyone who reads it. Klein also gives intimate insight into adolescence, desire and the grotesque lengths some are willing to go in order to feel like they belong. Now for those who don't know, the Manson family was a desert commune and cult led by Charles Manson that was active in California in the late 1960s and early 70s. The group consisted of 100 of his followers who lived an unconventional lifestyle with habitual use of hallucinogenic drugs. Now on the evening of August 8th 1969, four members of the Manson family invaded the home of actress Sharon Tate and movie director Roman Polanski and murdered Tate who was almost 9 months pregnant at the time, along with three friends who were visiting and an 18 year old visitor who was slain as he was leaving the home. The Manson family were brutal and absolutely abhorrent, so if you want to read a fictional depiction of the group, check out the girls. And finally coming in at number 1, Jonestown and Other Madness by Pat Parker. Now backstory before we get into the meat of the book by Pat Parker, on November 18th 1978 a total of nearly 918 people died in a settlement at the nearby airstrip in Port Ketuma and at a temple run building in Georgetown. Now the People's Temple Agricultural Project, better known by its informal name, Jonestown, was a remote settlement established by the People's Temple, a cult under the leadership of Jim Jones. In total, around 909 individuals died in Jonestown, all but two from apparent cyanide poisoning in an event that has been referred to as a revolutionary suicide by Jones and some of his cult. Now let's track back. Jones had founded what became the People's Temple in Indiana in 1950s, then relocated his congregation to California in the 60s. In the 70s, however, following negative media attention, the preacher moved with around 1,000 of his followers to the Guinea's jungle where he promised a utopian community. That is not what they received because as aforementioned on the day of November 18th 1978, US Representative Leo Ryan who had gone to Jonestown to investigate claims of abuse was murdered along with four members of his delegation by Jonestown gunmen. That very same day Jones ordered his followers to ingest poison laced punch while armed guards watched on. Now in the book Jonestown and Other Madness by Pat Parker, she examines the rise and fall of the charismatic turned murderous preacher Jim Jones as a celebrated lesbian feminist poet Pat Parker's collection is a gripping reflection on the way race, class and gender played into Jim Jones' sadistic slaughter of his congregation. Throughout the book she challenges us to reflect on how easily we accept answers given to us in the wake of a tragedy. I quote, If 900 white people had gone to a country with a black minister and committed suicide, would we have accepted the answer we were given so easily? The book is fantastic and incredibly moving. Not just that, but it's also the perfect insight into one of the most notorious cults and infamous matters. Number 5. The Bilderberg Meeting Starting us off today, we are going to be talking about the uber secretive Bilderberg meeting. Now this one is a little bit of a cheat because technically it's not really a society, but it refers to an annual gathering that definitely happens without any of us knowing in secrecy and involves a lot of key profile VIPs, so I'd say it qualifies. The first Bilderberg meeting dates all the way back to 1954 and was held at the Hotel de Bilderberg in the Netherlands, which is where the group has taken its name since. Convened by Prince Bernhard, the gathering was a collection of powerful politicians from North America and Europe, designed to foster warmer relations between the two continents among fear of growing anti-American sentiment in Europe. In layman's terms, the Bilderberg meeting is an annual meeting where high-ranking politicians agree to not start World War III just yet. You know, just not not just yet. They'll, they'll do it eventually, but keep things cool for now. Now, because of this, the Bilderberg meeting has quite the guest list. It's a veritable who's who: Bill Clinton, Margaret Thatcher, Angela Merkel, Tony Blair. Henry Kissinger, Pete Davidson, to name a few. Now what happens in these meetings is anyone's guess, as they're wrapped in complete and utter secrecy. The minutes are never released and journalists are barred from reporting on it at all. In fact, I would not be surprised if this video was the first time you've ever even heard of this. The secrecy definitely paves the way for rumors, with the belief that the Bilderberg meeting is an extension of the Illuminati, with the members being part of the New World Order conspiring to control the world behind the scenes. Now the official website for the Bilderberg meeting maintains, thanks to the private nature of the meeting, the participants take part as individuals rather than in any official capacity, and hence are not bound by the conventions of their office or by positions, which definitely makes things more sus. 
suspicious. We'll get to the bottom of this, I'm sure. But if you're looking for more conspiracies, well, Top 5 Scary has all of that and then some. We've got loads of things on secret societies, ghosts, ghouls, goblins, aliens, UFOs. If it's freaking you out, we've got a video or two on it, I promise you that. So hit subscribe, please do me a little favor and ring that little bell as well so you don't miss a single one of our videos. But do that at the end of this one, because I got four more secret societies that I'd love to tell you all about. Number 4, The Knights of Pythias. Coming up next is going to be the very mythical sounding Knights of Pythias. Oh, we love when a secret society is an order of knights. Oh, I love when something sounds like that, you know, they sound like I gotta go bring them an ancient crystal. The Knights of Pythias was founded by Justus H. Rathbone, a government employee in Washington, D.C. in 1864, who historically has one of the coolest names I've ever heard. Justus H. Rathbone. My god, that just rolls off the tongue. He felt there was an absolute moral need for an organization that practiced brotherly love. He loved Philadelphia. City of brotherly love, he was all about that. Around the same time, the country was involved in a bit of a punch-up, bit of a brother against brother, a bit of a, a civil war, you might call it. So, brotherly love was needed. President Lincoln, upon learning of this group, expressed his approval of its mission and values, and the Knights became the first fraternal organization in the states to be chartered through an act of Congress. Now, the name is a reference to the Greek legend of Damon and Pythias, the Pythagorean ideal of friendship, which I, I guess means that this secret society in Washington, D.C. is the Knights of Friendship. That's a that, that's adorable. All of its founding members worked for the government, and the Knights' colors are blue, yellow, and red. Blue signifying friendship, yellow charity, and red benevolence. The Knights of Pythias are still operating to this day, and are a partner of the Boy Scouts of America. That's hilarious. The second organization to receive its charter from the U.S. Congress. That's the official hierarchy in America. It's Knights and then Boy Scouts. Those <laughs> now, interestingly, the Knights of Pythias, despite their very, very cool name, may very well be one of the only secret societies no one is writing any conspiracy theories about. And I was looking, I really was, but the people in the tinfoil hats are not interested in the Knights of Pythias. Maybe it's because unlike most other secret groups, the Knights really boldly announce that they're just all about friendship and maybe people suspect they're not hiding anything and maybe they're just totally genuine and all about friendship. That won't do for me. I think the whole friendship thing is a complete angle. I think the Knights of Pythias are doing something subliminal, something. They're hacking the airwaves somehow. We'll look into that. We're going to get back to this. Number three, the Fundamentalist Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saint, known as FLDS for short. Time to focus on the fundamentalist sects that uh, split off when the core religion opted to renounce the practice of polygamy. Technically speaking, polygamy is the practice or custom of having more than one wife or husband at the same time. And while I'm not judging multiple partners or open relationships when they're consensual or of age, there's a lot of ick to unpack here. It is estimated that 6,000 to 10,000 members reside within the congregate sister sites of Hilldale, Utah, Colorado City, Arizona, El Dorado, Texas, Westcliff, Colorado, Mancos, Colorado, Creston and Bountiful, British Columbia, and Pringle, South Dakota. Those who wish to continue the practice remained Mormon, but on their own terms. Polygamy remains, you know, illegal, and in 1953, an entire FLDS community was arrested in Short Creek, Arizona, otherwise known as modern day Colorado City, and most had their little ones taken from them for safety. A compound in Texas was raided in 2008 after Child Protective Services was made aware of allegations of poor living situations. Over 400 younglings were taken from the compound and placed in CPS custody. So I remember hearing about the raid while watching the Oprah Winfrey show with my mom of all things. If my brain serves me right, it was about 10 months after the raid when all of the younglings were returned to the Yearning for Zion ranch, and it was such huge news that she was being granted access to this top secret compound. Leader of the FLDS, Warren Jeffs, remains in his position, you know, despite being in prison for life after acts against minors. Number 2, Aum Shinrikyo. Founded by Shoko Asahara in 1984, Aum Shinrikyo is a Japanese new religious movement and doomsday cult who first made headlines in the late 80s amid accusations that Asahara was forcing members to donate money to the group and holding them against their will. Pardon me, I'll backtrack for a moment. Although Aum was, you know, from the beginning considered controversial in Japan, it was not initially associated with serious crimes. Aum's public relations activities included publishing comics and animated cartoons that attempted to tie its religious ideas to popular anime and manga themes, including space missions, powerful weapons, world conspiracies, and the quest for ultimate truth. Like many cult leaders, Azahar believed in an imminent doomsday. This time it was caused by a world war started by the United States. And of course, you know, according to him, only his followers would survive 
alive. In 1991, Ahn began using wiretapping to get NTT uniforms and equipment and created a manual for wiretapping. In July of 1993, cult members sprayed large amounts of liquid containing Bacillus anthracis spores from a cooling tower on the roof of Am Shinrikyo's Tokyo headquarters. However, their plan to cause an anthrax epidemic failed. The attack resulted in a large number of complaints about bad odors, but no infections. Thank goodness. But by the end of 1993, the cult started secretly manufacturing the nerve agent Sarin and later VX. Om tested its Sarin on sheep at Benjawarn Station, a remote pastoral property in Western Australia, killing 29 sheep. So both Sarin and VX were then used in several assassinations and attempts between 1994 to 95. In 1995, the group executed a Sarin gas attack in the Tokyo subway, which caused the deaths of 12 people and injured 50 more. The group says that those who carried out attacks did so secretly, without being known to other executives and ordinary believers. After that attack, Japanese authorities learned that the group had also been responsible for the death of lawyer Tutsumi Sakamoto, who was working on a class action lawsuit against Am Shinrikyo at the time of his death. Oh, uh, almost forgot, the group also killed his wife and descendant. Yes, independent people. On July 6 of 2018, after exhausting all appeals, Asahara and six followers on death row were executed as punishment for the 1995 attacks and other crimes. So I'm glad that unlike, you know, some of the other folks I've discussed today, some justice was actually served in this situation. Six additional followers were executed on the 26th of the same month, and at 12.10am on New Year's Day of 2019, at least nine people were injured when a car was deliberately driven into crowds celebrating the New Year on Takashita Street in Tokyo. Local police reported the arrest of Kazuhiro Kusakabe, the suspected driver, who allegedly admitted to intentionally ramming his vehicle into crowds to protest his opposition to the death penalty, specifically in retaliation for the execution of the uh, before mentioned Om um, cult members. Number one, Good News International Church. The Good News International Ministries, GNIM for short, or Good News International Church, was founded by Paul McKenzie and his first wife in 2003. So this group attracted international attention in April of this year when it was revealed that McKenzie had allegedly instructed members to starve themselves to meet Jesus before the end of the world, which has resulted in the deaths of over 400 people. And when you consider more than 600 people have been reported missing, it's just a yikes situation. About 65 rescued followers were charged with attempted self-ending of life after they refused to eat during their stay at a rescue center. The doomsday cult is adamantly anti-Western, and with amenities such as healthcare, education, and sports being dismissed as evils of Western life, and with Mackenzie condemning the United States, the United Nations, and the Catholic Church as tools of Satan. Look, I'm all for condemning the Catholic Church, but call Calling it a tool of Satan feels like an oxymoron. The group devotes much of its teachings to the end times, ergo I've been dubbed a doomsday cult. The definition of which is a cult that believes in apocalyptism and millennialism including both these, you know, that predict disasters and those that attempt to destroy the entire universe. Mackenzie founded the GNIM in 2003 and accumulated a sizable following, largely due to convincing his followers that he could speak directly with God. Beginning in the late 2010s, Mackenzie's church began to receive a renewed wave of scrutiny regarding the internal practices of the organization, particularly in 2017 when Mackenzie and his wife faced several charges relating to the church. He was chastised for inciting students to abandon their education after denouncing it as ungodly, as well as radicalizing and denying medical care to them afterwards. Several students died as a result, and in 2017, 93 students were rescued by government authorities from the group. After another arrest in 2019, he departed Malindi and headed to the Shakahola Forest, where the mass starvation occurred earlier this year. Now, Mackenzie did not join his followers in the mass starvation. In fact, a dietary menu was found on the wall in one of the special houses in the forest, believed to be his resting room. He's currently under police custody as the process of exhuming the bodies continues. Police authorities claim that some bodies were missing organs and believed they were being harvested and sold. Kicking off at number 5 we have the Oracle of Delphi. At the very centre of the ancient Greek world is a strange hidden chasm that has been thought as fuel for the netherworld for thousands of years. On the slopes of Mount Parnassus underneath the colossal temple of Apollo, the seeds of the Delphic mystery cult came into fruition. In essence, the Oracle of Delphi was a fortune teller, the high priestess of the temple known as the Pythia, which in ancient Greek translates as the verb to rot, in reference to the slain monstrous python at the centre of their belief. The Pythia would sit above a huge chasm deep in the bowels of the temple and breathe in a concoction from the depths below, thought to give her hallucinogenic properties that would induce prophecy. So accurate were her predictions though that the Pythia was thought to be the most influential woman in the classical world. Whoever held the title would go on to influence the decisions of Alexander the Great, Croesus and King Leonidas just to name a few. Coming in at number 4 we have Mithraism. Also known as the Mithraic Mysteries, this ancient Roman cult was centred on the god Mithra 
Mithras, an ancient Persian god which is also tied to the Sanskrit Mitra, a god of the sun. Now, if we're talking the stereotypical aspects of a cult, then this is where it all started. Strange, complex sets of initiations, secret handshakes and bizarre, ordained meetings in hidden underground temples. You know the stuff. A lot of them are still around today actually, one of the best preserved being in London, England of all places. Just a few steps away from the Bank of England is London's Mithraeum, where ancient Roman soldiers would meet in secrecy and whisper the name of their god. But what's so scary about that? you know, sounds harmless enough. Well, these guys were totally obsessed with Mithras slaying the bull and ritualistically reenacted it whenever they got the chance with live animals and the consumption of flesh. Gradually, this got a little bit out of hand and people became part of the menu. Yep. Cannibalism. Also a little bit scary, but many people believe that the Mithraic cult is still around today, just lurking somewhere in the shadows, probably London. Coming in at number three, we have Children of the Corn. Children in horror movies are already creepy, but put them in a cult, a cult composed solely of children, then you have a recipe for absolutely terrifying scares. Children of the Corn, based on the book of the same name by Stephen King, is a supernatural folk horror starring Linda Hamilton and Peter Haunton, and is set in a fictitious rural town of Gatlin, Nebraska. The film tells the story of a malevolent entity referred to as He Who Walks Behind the Rose, which entices the town's children to ritually murder all the town's adults and a couple driving across the country to ensure a successful corn harvest. As the couple arrive in the small, seemingly abandoned town, they discover the congregation of children led by a girl named Rachel, with them performing a cultural birthday ritual for Amos by drinking his blood from a pentagram-shaped cut on his body. Amos has turned 19, therefore is considered old enough for his passing, joining their god in the cornfield. Now, while the movie as a whole was a little disappointing, it does deliver on the horrors of cults. Not to mention there were seven sequels, with the first being far superior. The cult movie in turn gained a cult following, with it being hit among movie lovers. Coming in at number two, we have Hereditary. One of two Ari Aster movies on our list, Hereditary was a surprise horror movie, with the reveal of its cult being kept a secret for much of the movie, making it incredibly unexpected when it begins to unfold. Released in 2018, Hereditary is Ari Aster's directorial debut, with it starring Tony Collette and Alex Wolfe as a family haunted by a mysterious presence after the death of their secretive grandmother. However, what begins as a sober family drama very quickly descends into a crazy supernatural horror. What begins as a slow burn quickly catapults into a disturbing horror after an incident involving the family's son and daughter, leaving viewers covering their mouths. As a result of the incident, the mother, Annie, is forced to turn to a support group member, Jones, for support, learning ways she can contact the realm of the supernatural. However, this has devastating consequences, with her awakening something that should never have been awoken. Viewers very quickly learn that a demon-worshipping cult are the true causes of the family's misery and pain. Where still, Ari Aster plants easter eggs throughout the movie as a way of warning us of things to come. However, saying that, most of us may have missed these subliminal messages, but what I can say is, the wall-crawling demon was revealed long before the last 30 minutes of the movie, with the cult being there all along, watching the family and waiting for their moment. The cult in Hereditary are worshippers of Payman, one of Lucifer's most obedient devotees, who rules 200 legions of angels, and is connected to the Tree of Death, hence why the treehouse in Hereditary is so important. The summoning of payment is gradual throughout the movie, but when he finally arrives and seeks solace in the body of one of the characters, well, it's enough to send shivers down anyone's spine. And finally, coming in at number one, we have Midsummer. There are a few things more terrifying than a cult in horror movies. A group of people devoted to a dark high power who will do absolutely anything to appease the deity. No movie displays this as effectively as Ari Aster's Midsommar. Released in 2019, Midsommar is a folk horror film starring my queen, Florence Pugh, and follows a group of friends who travel to Sweden for a festival that occurs once every 90 years, only to find themselves in the clutches of a pagan cult. Now, unlike Ari Aster's Hereditary, Midsommar lays out its intentions from the very start of the movie. The movie kicks off with Danny discovering the death of both her sister and parents, with the instant putting a strain on Danny's relationship with her already distant boyfriend Christian. Not long after, she learns that Christian has planned a trip to Sweden with his friends to attend a midsummer celebration at an ancestral commune, so the group packs up and heads out. Things very quickly descend into madness, with the group arriving and being met by a large group of white cult members in a very peculiar white outfit with Danny realizing that something isn't quite right here. However, her 
concerns are proven correct when two commune elders die by senicide via leaping from a clifftop. When the male elder survives the fall, the cult mimics his wails of agony and crushes his skull with a mallet. Yeah, things aren't fun in Sweden right now. Now, without ruining much more for those who haven't watched it yet, the cult does what is necessary to summon the dark higher power that they worship, with the American tourist being used as a sacrifice for the demon. Now, more interesting still, while this movie isn't entirely based on a real cult, director Ariasta does describe it as a stew of sorts. I quote, we're drawing from actual Swedish traditions. We're drawing from Swedish folklore, we're drawing from Norse mythology. All in all, Midsummer successfully draws on the disturbing conventions of cultist horror to generate a sense of dread and unease, making it my favourite folk horror movie and cult horror movie of all time. Number 5. The Skull and Bone Society Now, I'm going to be honest, this video might be the one to get the channel taken down. I've made a lot of bold videos, I've made some very, very heretical claims against the Catholic Church, and I've said some wild things and claimed them as facts regarding the Megalodon, but this might be the video to get the channel blacklisted as we start diving into and talking about some of the most secretive societies out there. The Skull and Bone Society is one of the more well-known secret societies, and yeah, I guess that's kind of an oxymoron. It's an undergraduate society at Yale University. Founded in 1832, it's renowned the world over for just how darn secretive it is and its practice of strange rituals and its secret membership. Partly why it's so captivating to conspiracy theorists is its alumni are something to boast about. Many presidents have been members of the Skull and Bones Society, both Bush Sr. and Jr. Speculation runs rampant when it comes to the Skull and Bones. So suggesting that powerful elites from within influence politics and finance. Now, membership, as one could expect, is very limited to a select few senior students at Yale who are chosen through mysterious ways, okay? You need to work on a lot more than just your GPA. I don't even know how to get in or, or what the criteria is, but it's not just anybody. These initiates are referred to as bonesmen. The society's rituals are kept to the utmost secrecy, even after their time in the society. After you leave, you can't go around telling everybody about the Skull and Bone Society and all the stuff you got up to, and clearly no one's doing that because it was not easy to find information for this. Some suggest the society acts as a breeding ground for future leaders, wielding significant power in business, politics, and finance, while others believe they're part of a larger cabal of conspiracies with hidden agendas tied to the Masons and the Illuminati. Now, there is precious little information regarding the Skull and Bones out there. We know it exists. That much is true. And many powerful people have claimed or have been claimed to be the members. But as far as actual cold hard facts about what happens behind closed doors, we don't know a lot. I am but a humble YouTuber. I never went to Yale. Uh, if anyone wants to extend me an invite, I think the top five scary DMs are open. But for now, we know precious little about the infamous secret society. Now, we may not know a lot about the skull and bones, but we have lots of other secrets for you to unveil from everything from Bigfoots, ghosts, conspiracies, ghouls, goblins, pretty much anything scary or freaky under the sun or above it, we've got a video or two on. So hit subscribe to Top 5 Scary. Please ring that little, little bitty little bell so you don't miss a video. But do that at the end of this video so I can tell you about all these other secret societies, okay? Number four, Freemasonry. Our next entry is the Freemasons, a group I am sure you've probably heard of before. The Freemasons are a fraternal organization that traces its origins back to the medieval guild of stonemasons. Makes sense? Now, while its early history is rooted in the craft of stone masonry, or blue collar work, the modern day Freemasons have evolved into a global fraternity that promotes brotherhood, personal development, philanthropy, and if you believe the stories, might secretly be running the world from behind the shadows. Freemasons Freemasonry has long been associated with conspiracies, definitely because of its secretive nature, its symbols, and its historical prominence. The group actually does have slight ties to the founding of the Illuminati, with the group's order serving as inspiration for Adam Weishaupt's group, which we will talk about more about at the end of the video. Freemasons are sometimes spoken of like a synonym for the Illuminati, like they're interchangeable groups, with the belief that Freemasons are involved in clandestine activity. To the theorists, Freemasons control governments, banks, using their influence and pointing out that throughout history, many notable world leaders and key figures have been Freemasons or have had familial ties to Freemasonry. And there are some wilder conspiracy theories out there too that suggest that Freemasonry is tied to supernatural or occult practices, claiming that Freemasons engage in esoteric rituals and possess hidden knowledge, ancient mysteries, secret teachings. Uh, these beliefs make Freemasonry out to be a, a real secrety, secret kind of cult organization. Now, 
Freemasonry is real. Nobody's doubting that, nobody's disproving that. The chances are actually pretty good that there's probably a Freemason Lodge very close to where you live. The Freemasons boast brotherhood, fraternity, philanthropy, personal development, and they've got all these lovely things on their website, and I'm more than inclined to agree it really is just a place to hang out and rub elbows with other people, or is that all just a very convenient cover story to cover over the truth? Coming in at number three, Congregation for the Light. Now, the majority of this list are organizations that are happily out in the open, that try and amass as many members as they can get under their leadership. Well, these guys like to do things a little bit differently. Strangely enough though, they like to be out in the open, avoiding the backwater compounds synonymous with many other cults, and instead having their headquarters deep in the heart of Manhattan. They're controlled by one all-powerful leader, Tom Bear, a 73-year-old Ohio native who denies that the light is a cult. He preaches bizarre racial things theories regarding Aryans and Atlantis, preps his people for a doomsday event, speaks about complex mythology involving owls and squirrels, and has an all-powerful grip on the relationships and love lives of its members. The Congregation of the Light is an incredibly small cult, having only roughly 200 members, but the scary thing is how secluded the group are, with the majority of them being born into the light. Bringing us in at number two, Happy Science. Happy Science. Well, its name definitely doesn't reflect the tone of its actual nature. In fact, as far as terrifying modern cults go, Happy Science is probably near the top of the list. An absolute mishmash mashup of world religions, from New Age hocus pocus to far right nationalism. The leader of Happy Science, a man named Raihuo Akawa, claims that he's a supreme being called El Kanter, a combination of Jesus Christ, the Buddha, and the Prophet Muhammad. Formed in 1986 by the former salaryman, Akawa initially called the group the God Light Association. Association. His pursuit is to create a nine-dimensional heaven, whatever that may be, with himself at the head of the whole cult of personality shenanigans. Here's the kicker though, the group claims to have over 12 million members worldwide, and have also founded their own political wing called the Happiness Realization Party. And here's the crazy part, this group advocates violent Japanese nationalism, denying historical atrocities, and advocating for war between China and North Korea. Korea. Let's hope they stay just a cult, right? And finally, at our number one spot, Nexium. If you're wanting to find a modern cult that is incredibly recent, then look no further than Nexium. According to their website, Nexium is a company whose mission is to raise human awareness, foster an ethical humanitarian civilization, and celebrate what it means to be human. Well, apparently that translates to being at best an abusive pyramid scheme, and at its disgustingly worse, a human trafficking operation and sex cult subsidized by expensive brainwashing. Nexium and its owners have been indicted on several federal charges, including sex trafficking, and have been accused of being a recruiting platform for a cult operating within it, variously known as DOS or The Vow, where women members in particular were forced into sexual slavery and physical abuse. It's a disgusting modicum of the abuse of power demonstrated at the expense of vulnerable individuals. The cult was found in 1998 by Keith Ranier, who through several decades of deception managed to coerce over 17,000 under the organization's influence. This has included a huge amount of celebrities, actors, actresses, models, and other public figures. The lid was fully blown open in March 2018 when Ranier was arrested and federally indicted, shortly followed by other important figures in the cult. Well, they go to trial in October 2018. Coming in at number five, Rosemary's Baby. Roman Polanski's masterpiece Rosemary's Baby set the standard for many cultist horror movies, particularly in the way it reveals the cult, using a steady and slow build and paranoia, confusing us as to what exactly is even happening. This 1968 horror stars Mia Farrow and chronicles the story of a pregnant woman who suspects that an evil cult wants to take her baby for use in their rituals. However, it is quickly revealed that her husband has made a deal with the devil for success in his acting career and the price is offering up his wife as a surrogate mother for something truly evil, Satan's son. That's right, the cult uses Rosemary as a sacrificial lamb for Satan's grand return through his own offspring, and it is truly terrifying. The general sense of unease throughout the movie is why Rosemary's baby is an absolute classic. 
and perhaps one of the scarier movies in the horror genre. The horrors depicted on and off the screen aided in the rumour that the film was actually cursed by the cult and summoned demons, with many incidents occurring off screen to the cast and crew, including the slaying of Roman Polanski's wife, Sharon Tate, at the hands of the Manson family. Coming in at number four, VHS 2 Safe Haven. Safe Haven is one of four sections in the 2013 anthology found footage sequel VHS 2, with the segment being directed by Timo Tijanto and Gareth Hugh Evans, and being the best section in the entirety of the movie. The plot follows a news crew composed of four members, who infiltrate an Indonesian cult in the hopes of shooting a documentary about their mysterious activities. Inside the building, they find the walls adorned in bizarre symbols, school children in classrooms, and women dressed in white garments. One of the crew, Malik, then overhears that his fiancée, Lena, is pregnant with another crew member's child, Adam. Things then descend into total madness. The deeper the crew go inside the building, with Lena being abducted by several women, with the cult hunting down the crew members for sacrificial reasons. Now, with only 29 minutes to play with, Evans and Tajanto don't hold back, not even for a second, with the segment being insanely action-packed and gore-filled from start to finish. Not to mention it builds to an insane, gore-soaked climax that will shock the audience cult are successful in their demon summoning, with the beast making its grand appearance towards the final moments of the movie, and it does not disappoint. Number 3, The Knights Templar. Now perhaps you know this next group best as the villains of the Assassin's Creed franchise, or depending on your personal philosophies, the unspoken hero of the Assassin's Creed franchise, but that's another story. The Knights Templar were a medieval Christian military order, formed in the 12th century to protect the pilgrims that were travelling to Jerusalem during the Crusades. Very, very quick. Quickly, the Templars grew in power, wealth, and influence, and this band of swordsmen quickly rose to establish a network all across Europe. Now, there have been a ton of conspiracies revolving around the Knights Templars over the years. I'm sure partly because the Knights Templars is a very cool sounding name. They also had a sudden and dramatic downfall. Didn't have anything to do with any order of hay jumping assassins, but they did close their gates pretty quickly. In 1307, King Philip IV of France initiated a campaign against the Templars, accusing them of many heinous crimes, heresies, idolatry, corruption, secret ceremonies. Now the order was officially disbanded after this, and many of its members were arrested, interrogated, and executed. And quick aside, the Templars really did do a lot of these things, and the Templars did unspeakable things during the Crusades, and it's not that far to say the Templars were a very, very, very malignant presence. One prominent conspiracy theory suggests that the Templars possessed hidden knowledges or relics, including the Holy Grail or Ark of the Covenant, believing these sacred artifacts bestowed them incredible power and influence. Some people also theorize that the Templars knew they were going to be disbanded, and they concealed these treasures to pass them on to other secret societies. This shows up very, very prominently in Assassin's Creed, where the Templar Order sort of splinters off into all these different little groups, but holds on to these pieces of Eden, these powerful relics that give them all these powers, but I gotta stop talking about Assassin's Creed. Another theory links the Templars to Freemasonry, suggesting that the Order's traditions, symbolism, and rituals were passed down and sort of given to the Freemasons, which is why the Freemasons, the Knights Templar, and the Illuminati are so connected in conspiracy circles. Some conspiracists propose that the Templars survived their dissolution, and the disbandment was just a cover story, and they're still operating their clinking swords together having secret meetings. They went underground, established new organizations, and now they're rebranding themselves. Some claiming that they played a role in shaping historical events, such as the American Revolution, or founding these modern banking systems, and eventually sort of snaked their way into every other general controlling the world conspiracy theory. Yeah, big ol' pause. Number two, the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. Wow. Coming up next is going to be the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, which was a mystical 19th century order emerging in England, and one of the best names for a secret society like ever. This sounds like the villains of a Final Fantasy game. The order was famous for its esoteric tradition and practice of magic. Yep, the order that sounds like it's a bunch of wizards did practice magic. The Golden Dawn sought to explore the spiritual and occult aspects of the world through their rituals and symbolism. Now, the order was founded by three key individuals. That's William Woodman, William Westcott, and Samuel Little McGregor Mathers, who secretly resented the other two members for having alliterative W names, and he felt deeply left out. Over the years, the Golden Dawn would attract plenty of notable figures, including notorious occultist Aleister Crowley, 
who did also inspire one of the best Black Sabbath songs. Internally, the Golden Dawn experienced a manner of conflict. Disagreement over leaderships, initiation, and the true nature of the Order's teachings and mission were all things that caused strife. Some people later on have suggested these internal conflicts were planned to maintain control and secrecy over the organization. Imagine that. Your organization is so secret, you need to get rid of your own members. Keep them out of the loop. They know too much. Conspiracists believe that the Order's supernatural ties mean they are involved with some paranormal entities. Maybe we're getting a little bit out there. Believing that they were able to manipulate and control individuals and situations. They could control minds and influence. Summon demons. Of course, it could also just be a giant load of hullabaloo and the Golden Dawn could have been nothing more than a bunch of old men role playing wizards like a Dungeons and Dragons club. We'll probably never know the truth though. At number one, we got the Illuminati proper. They had to be the number one secret society, right? Who else could it have been? Is there a more famous secret society? There's probably more secret societies, but I wouldn't know about them. You certainly know the Illuminati as this shadowy organization of puppet masters pulling the strings and influencing the world behind their scenes, using Jay-Z and Beyonce to further their goals somehow. But what do you know of the group's origins? to separate the fact through the fiction. Let me take you on a journey after a few minutes of Google searching. The infamously secretive order's origins can actually be traced back kinda easy to a university professor named Adam Weishaupt in 1776. He taught natural law at a university in Bavaria and was orphaned at an early age. He was then raised by his erudite uncle who fostered a love of knowledge in the boy. Adam loved knowledge and thought that consuming knowledge was life's greatest pursuit. He was very frustrated by countries and states that were dominant by religion, like his Catholic homeland of Bavaria. He was very anti-Catholic church, a position that was not particularly looked upon with favor at the time. Now, Adam had envisioned a tight group of people who could challenge the church's stranglehold on information, and he saw a formal group in mind focused on illumination rather than suppression. There is definitely some irony in a group that's so famous now for secrecy and mystery that its original intention was to illuminate people. Initially, Weishaupt sought out the Order of Freemasons, believing that the Freemasons were exactly the men he was looking for. But he was denied entry. Frustrated, Adam chose to seek out his own people and dubbed his new group the Order of the Illuminati, but based his organization very strongly on the Freemasons. He borrowed their hierarchy, code names, clandestine dealings, a lot of their symbolism. And this is largely why people sort of mistake the two groups and correlate them together, lump them in with the same conspiracies. Adam did also plot several Freemasons from lodges to come join, so undoubtedly there was crossover between both groups, but they're different things. Since then, pretty much every single conspiracy theory imaginable has been connected to the Illuminati. Governments, banks, entertainment, bada 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 bada. It's all orchestrated by the Illuminati and we simply play out their script. Symbols such as the Eye of Providence are seen as proof, you know, it's on the dollar bill or there's symbology used in music videos and entertainment. That's proof of the group's control. Anytime you see Jay-Z doing one of these, that's proof that he's an Illuminati agent. So there was a real Illuminati, definitely, and there were a bunch of Bavarian nerds, but is there still an Illuminati pulling all the strings? 